you know, you got to have the agency to get things done. Um, mm -hmm. You and I have talked about this. You know, I, on paper, I'm not particularly gifted, but I ended up doing all this cool stuff in the military. Not because I'm gifted, but because I, I had the will and I chose to go do these you things. You said yes. I said yes. Hey guys, welcome back. I am Jason Salyer and this is my good friend Joe. Hi. And we are discussing why, or why not, why is it important to learn primitive skills, bushcraft skills, is it necessary, is it irrelevant? I mean, why waste your time learning how to rub two sticks together when you could just use a Bic lighter? They're That's everywhere, right. right? That's right. What do you think? Well, the so from a military standpoint, um, knowledge is free, and you can carry as much of it as you want, right? It has no weight value to it. It's in between my ears. And what I like about primitive skills is if I had to, if I had to walk out of my house buck naked, I know what I need to know to start a fire, get shelter, get food, get water, and, and, and at least service my very basic, you know, Human biological needs, needs yeah. right? And, and I think that's where primitive skills come in. Uh, we had talked about before in the other video, uh, some of the logistics reasons for it, like, you know, running out of lighters and matches. Was there, but, so if you hadn't seen that video, that's okay. So uh, in Bosnia, for example, when everything collapsed, the people ran out of lighters and matches. So there was eventually, no, yes. Yeah, eventually, not right away. They ran out eventually of lighters. They ran out of matches, and it got really cold. Yeah, it gets cold in East Yeah, and there was no way to start a fire unless you knew how to improvise one. But we don't actually know what our emergency is going to be. We don't. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can plan for geographically specific things like hurricanes in Florida, tornadoes in Georgia. Um, we can plan for those things. earthquakes mm -hmm. in California. Um, and we can pack accordingly, but you don't actually know what's going to happen. I mean, anything from a plane crash you survive to, yeah. uh, the best example I can give of needing a survival kit in general, but survival skills that I can give in recent times that I've experienced was several years back, the snowpocalypse of Atlanta. Yeah. Um, I just kind of got not, out of the... Not a lot of snow, by the way. Not a lot of snow at all. <laughs> and, and it goes back to... Yeah. I think it was bad because the leadership of Atlanta intentionally mismanaged it to see what would happen mm. in the same way that the Seattle leadership intentionally mismanaged the riots. Because how could they do it so wrong? Uh, <laughs> Not if it wasn't intentional. Everybody, and I mean everybody, knew the snow was coming a week out. Yeah. Everybody knew this. It was on all the radios, all the TVs. In Atlanta, on the day of the snow, uh, didn't let anybody out, right? And by anybody, anybody they have control over, right? Mm -hmm. And then all at the same time at lunch, all government employees, schools, blah, 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 uh -huh. all closed at lunch, mm -hmm. caused a traffic jam and shut the city down. All right, everybody that was in, in they should have all been fired. Mm -hmm. Every, police chief, fire chief, mayor, they should have all been fired. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I'm in this situation. Uh, at the time, my girlfriend, uh, now wife, uh, she was working on one side of Atlanta and we were living on the other. And she had foot surgery. And I just happened to be having lunch with her, you know, at that, in that moment. Uh, so lucky for her. I, she, I was there. I had stuff in the trunk, but I know how to drive in the snow. It's not difficult, but you do need to figure out how to do it, right? Mm -hmm. You don't take it for granted you can drive in the snow, as many people in Atlanta figured out. But I, I was taken back by uh, several very basic observations of just how unprepared the everyday citizen in Atlanta is. I would see people ditch their cars, right? Um, walking down the street in suits, High heels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they're going to work because they had they didn't have a jacket in their car. Spare shoes, nothing. And I would see them with, with gas station bags mm -hmm. because they had to walk to the gas station to buy food and whatever. All the gas stations were out of food except junk food. And yeah. that was getting a little low. So people were resupplying from gas stations, water, walking around, everything, water, yeah. everything. It was, it was just pathetic how the everyday People froze to death. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, so you would have people in certain situations where they were freezing in their cars 10 feet from the wood line. It's like, yeah. guys, go start a fire. What's, yeah. wrong? What's wrong with you? Go start they, a fire. They, they ran out of gas. Car stopped running. Couldn't believe it. And died so, of hypothermia. And they just sat there. Sat there and died. Yeah. And then you had some issues with, uh, like, ambulances would have people in the back and couldn't get nowhere. And they're just stuck. So you really were on your own. And at some point, the police issued a, over the radio, uh, public radio, had issued a statement saying that they're only going to respond now if there's, uh, I believe they said something, violent crime or traffic accidents of, was two or more, then upgraded oh, to wow. three or more. Wow. Right? They weren't coming. Because everybody's crashing. Because right? everybody's crashing. Yeah. And they had no reason to crash. But um, everybody was unprepared, and, and, and if I was to use the, the guy I remember seeing in a suit as an example of if I had to walk out of this house naked and I had to get by with just what's between my ears, you know, hey, maybe I had to stuff my jacket with some newspapers and some insulation. Sure. I, there's a lot of things I could have done with that rather than just walk and, and freeze. But I digress. So emergencies do happen. You don't know where they're going to come from. You don't know how they're going to happen. And you're, if it's an emergency, if it's a survival situation, you didn't have time to plan for it. Nope. It's not like, hold on a minute. Hold on, zombies. Right. Don't, don't Un attack. Unlike yet. the Atlanta <laughs> snowstorm, yeah. which yeah, had where you plenty can see it of warning, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes, most, most emergencies, I imagine out here where we live, there, I, I can totally see a situation where uh, you, you're forced off the road. Uh, either by conditions or whatever, but you, you end up off the road, up and pick a mountain pass, mm -hmm. and you're in trouble. Yeah. Like, so if you get thrown off the road up there and you're stuck on the ditch somewhere, um, that, that's going to be a life or death situation if uh, you don't have the supplies. At the very least, you should need to be able to walk out into the woods right. and start a fire. Yeah. Like, at the very least, you need to be able to start a fire. Mm -hmm. Friction fire, striker fires, all those things are great. So I think, um, so I think what it does for me is it gives me a lot of confidence. So, exactly. and, and because I have the confidence, I stress less. Exactly. So, and, and that would potentially make a survival situation, which is already stressful enough just in general, because of whatever, name mm -hmm. it, you know, the car crash, whatever, stuck in a ditch, your car's totaled, you're already stressed out, but I know because I can, I know for a fact I have the primitive skills. Even if I don't have the light in my pocket, I'm unprepared. I can still make the basic human needs happen yep. because of those skills. And I can put my my mental brain power towards solving other problems. Yeah, like knowing where to get water. Right. Um, you know, you want and that's a that's a primitive skill that yeah. I would say is like, where do you find clean, fresh water that yeah. you don't have to treat? Right, yeah, yeah. exactly. Do you want the green stagnant stuff, yeah. or do you <laughs> yeah. want the clear yeah. moving stuff? Sounds clear basic moving. and silly, but a lot of people, I feel like, don't possess that basic They, they don't, skill. and yeah. there's simple things, too, like uh, understanding how to make natural insulation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a big win. Listen, if you can prop yourself up and stick some pine needles and leaves underneath yeah. you, you're going to be we, doing a lot better. We intentionally went out, uh, I didn't, my, my buddy did, he intentionally went out wearing sandals in the wintertime. So we would have the opportunity to use our brains to improvise mm -hmm. and, and overcome that situation. So he's a pretty tough guy, but but basically what we ended up doing was taking his t-shirt, right? Taking his t-shirt and using cattail fluff, the, the seeds, nice. the seeds out of the yeah, cattails, yeah. and we wrapped his feet in those we call them cattail cruisers. Mm -hmm. And then put the sandals, <laughs> put the sandals over top. So he had insulated shoes at that point. That's so great. so that's a, I, I don't know if it's a primitive skill, but it's an improvisational skill that i think improv and primitive are basically two sides craft. of the same coin yeah um hey we live in the modern world if i'm walking throughout the woods and, I, and i'm buck naked and i find an empty water bottle like i got a water bottle yeah. now i mean check. check yeah so but being able to make stuff from scratch is 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 kind of i like what you said it, it gives you confidence mm -hmm. and ex a parallel example is I used to do a lot of mass casualty training in the military. And, you know, of course I had an A bag. So, uh, but we would do multiple iterations of the training in a day, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. Yeah. Well, you, you get tired of packing your A bag, right? How many tourniquets do you have? have right. Yeah. So eventually yeah. you start getting good at it. You've had a few runs under your belt. Your confidence is a bit higher. 
and you just start throwing a few things in your cargo pocket and it, and it turns out that's enough. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered over time is the better I got at, at improvisation and, and, and field craft skills in general with regards to, to my tactical skills, the less crap I had to carry. Sure. And in some cases, I would rather just make something the one time or the occasional time I need it than to, than to hump dead raider, weight around with me. Exactly. It, you know, so, sometimes... In case I may have to use yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, on the same situation, but I don't come from military backgrounds, but but uh, but I've, I've spent a lot of time in the woods being miserable, mm -hmm. right? By choice. <laughs> so, sure. so, there's some things that are worth just taking. Mm -hmm. Um, and I always, there's two things that are worth taking and that's, that is something to sleep on and something to cover to uh, some sort of shelter mm -hmm. because those two things, while I can improvise those things, I can improvise a mattress. I can make myself some sort of rainproof ish shelter. It takes so much effort. Like oh, it, it is, yeah, it's agree. a time. So it's going to take you all day to do that when you could just carry it. So, so that's the other side of the coin, right? So while I, I, but I still have those, those skills, I can do it. I right. just choose not to. <laughs> well, I mean, that matters. So yeah. when I, I was in SEER school, the first time I learned how to make a cool guy fire. Um, cool guy fire. You know, there's a standard in there. I forget what it is. You had to boil water and so on. Mm -hmm. But um, we're in there slaving away, trying to make our friction fires. And one of the cadre comes up to us and he's like, all right. I'm going to show you boys how to do this real easy. <laughs> so, of course, we listen because it's, it's hard to do. So, we mm -hmm. think this guy's going to pass along, you know, some ninja skills. The Jedi Master is the Right, so it gets real yeah. quiet. Right, the yeah. Jedi Master. So, it gets real quiet and we all start paying attention. Yeah. And he slowly pulls a lighter out of his pocket and goes, click. He says, don't lose your lighter. <laughs> He's like, all right. <laughs> Thanks message, for coming. <laughs> mess, message received. <laughs> yeah. So, I... I like, in my kit, whether it's some type of tactical kit or outdoor kit, I, I keep... Um, a waterproof lighter, like in my backpack, yeah. and my body armor, and my glove box. There's just kind of one here and there. Um, but I would also keep a few extra materials in case I had to do a friction fire, because hey, you lose stuff. Stuff breaks. What stuff happens if I have this really awesome pouch full of really awesome survival gear, and I fall down a ravine and lose yeah. the bag? Like, yeah, bear takes it. Unlikely, but it happens. Yeah. So having that backup. It's, it's, it's like a pace plan, a primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency planning. Mm -hmm. You know, those those, those uh, primitive skills are your absolute emergency level stuff. Figure out what it is you need to satisfy your biological needs. Mm -hmm. Have the correct equipment for it. But at the very least, have what's between your ears and be able to make it out in the woods. And yeah. you, sh you should be pretty confident. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah we, everybody gets caught up in the friction fire stuff because it's cool and it's fun to watch and... And I just think it's interesting. Um, but, I mean, it is, it's a it's a basic human skill mm -hmm. is to start a fire, I think. In, in my opinion, that should be taught at the grade school level, like how to start fire. And yeah, there's not, a lot of skills yeah. I think should be taught in school. <laughs> yeah, um, the grade school, elementary school, kindergarten level, they should learn how to do these basic things. Humans have had to start fire the hard way for the overwhelming majority. It's yeah. only a recent history where we had these luxury and convenience items, mm -hmm. like, like lighters and matches. Yeah. Couple hundred years at most. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it typically, uh, like in, in an average household, you know, it was a woman's job to start a fire because mm -hmm. that was relative to cooking and running the wood fire mm -hmm. stove. So everybody knew how to start a fire, not yeah. just, you know, Joe Blow Commando who goes yeah. out in the woods all the time. Everybody yeah. should know how to start a fire. And how to not let a fire go out, more more importantly, because because yeah. that's the thing. A lot, a lot of people think, this, you look at our ancestors and they think, oh, every time they needed a fire, they'd go out, they'd get the things, and they'd, they'd rub the sticks together and they'd start a fire. No, like that's, that would be stupid mm. because it's, one, very time-consuming, two, unreliable at best. It's weather-dependent, right? So, so what they would do is they would have their fire kits, of course. They'd start that fire, and if they were stationary for any period of time, just keep... Just keep the fire going. All you got to do is have a few embers in there. Just mm -hmm. keep it going. Just keep it going for a long... I kept a fire going for a month one time, nonstop, um, through storms and everything. But it's possible to do that, and it's so much easier to do that than it is to create it from scratch every single time. Yeah, uh, so fire management. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen it a lot, but I, I do see it where folks will try to, you know, let's say we're boil one cu cup in 15 minutes, I think or one canteen cup of water in 15 minutes. I think that's the Sears school standard. 
little mistakes because folks don't actually go out and practice it. They just kind of work on the skill. Um, like they wouldn't go get the wood. Like they had enough, but then they'd run out real quick. And now you and got crap. And they don't have a coal bed yet. Yeah. So you're in that mad dash to find anything Throwing and everything stuff that, on it. just to keep the coals yeah. going. But fire management's a thing. Not spreading the fire inadvertently is another thing. Mm -hmm. Do you know how to dig or create some type of fire system to where if it's just you, uh, you would be comfortable, you would be safe enough where you would feel comfortable sleeping with, with, with an ongoing source of heat. Um, it's a bit more than just starting the fire. A little thought has to go into yeah. it. It's survival. Yeah. It's a skill. It's a skill set. What about, um, what about making stuff? Just crafting in general. So like primitive skills, people... Um, People that are that are into the primitive skills that you talk about, like buckskin clothing and things like that, and and the moccasins and and all of that. Do you think? I have my opinions, but what is your opinion on on that being a practical thing? So, this day and age, in terms of everyday practicality, I don't know. I think that's subjective. I think uh, if I have the equipment, I'll use it. However, I was talking to you about that guy who went to Antarctica, right? There, there comes a time where you're just not going to get a resupply. Mm -hmm. So if something breaks, or like your shoes, just your shoes, or your soles uh, fall off your shoes, yeah, yeah, or you tear a sleeve, or your ruck breaks, it's like what are you gonna do? Yeah. You have to fix it. Nobody's gonna come out there and fix it. So a lot of those primitive skills, like 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 how to make leather good. At this too. point in time, I think primitive skills, uh, sewing, could be considered primitive skills. Nobody knows how to do that these anymore. days. Yeah, yeah. It seems like a primitive skill. yeah. But for sure, some of those primitive skills in terms of like basically being able to manufacture all your own stuff, it will go a long way towards keeping what you have going or replacing what you have as it's lost or broken. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It just, just, it just keeps the, uh, or just adds to the longevity of what it is that you have. Most of them might, I, I would think, is repairs. Yeah. But, um, so, story from my, my granny. My granny was born right at, like, right in the middle of the Great Depression. Um, and she grew up really poor, didn't have the money to buy anything. I mean, everybody was suffering during the Great Depression, mm -hmm. of course, but in, in Appalachia back then, they were really poor, didn't mm -hmm. have a lot of money. So, so her mother would make a lot of their clothing, mm -hmm. um, out of anything and everything. They used, uh, flour sacks mm -hmm. to make the clothing, um, just recycled whatever to make, make that stuff. I'll tell you what, the people in the, the folks that survived the Depression, they, they must think we're chumps. Yeah. When they see us now, like, you guys are so, so weak. So soft. You don't know anything. Yeah. You can't do anything. Yeah. But yeah, the Depression era folks had all that stuff dialed in. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, in, in the U.S., most folks don't take the time to learn how to repair their own car, repair their own home, yeah. and their own equipment until they don't have the money to pay somebody else to do it. Yeah. Um, it's a lost man skill right of just keeping what you have going yeah uh and those primitive skills you, you take that and you add it to the to, to a wilderness experience but those primitive skills keeping what you have serviceable that's mm. important oh yeah so maybe making i think flint napping or, or yeah is that a napping is that I, a practical I think, thing i i think so yeah i think if i'm in an extended stay in a wilderness setting or maybe i am in the an emergency in a wilderness setting post collapse and nobody's ever going to come it's just, you got what you got uh i think the ability to create some type of weapon um some type of hunting implement the ability to cut uh i think there's some value there mm -hmm. but a lot of these skills a lot of them like friction fires you know uh, making your own clothing and insulation shelters uh, and the flint napping, these are all things you do before the emergency. You learn before. Like when not, the, not the time to learn. Right, when to Noah yeah. build the ark, before, before the, the rain. flood. Right, yeah, <laughs> That's so right. same thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I just enjoy the primitive skills. I like doing the friction fires. I like, I'm not a flint napper by any means, but I like using Stone Age tools and things like that yeah. because I think it's really interesting that um, I think a lot of people... I, I, like for example, I've seen documentaries where scientists, you know, um, they they look they basically talk down about our ancestors as if they didn't ridiculous as if they didn't possess the skills or not skills the the knowledge that we do now. You know what I mean? I think that our ancestors, for sure, maybe didn't understand things exactly the same way that we do, but 
by no means were they idiots. I, I think that our ancestors, well, the only reason that we're here is because they were brilliant. I, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. 100%. They figured out... They figured out how to do the friction fire for the first time with, with nobody there saying, oh, yeah. what you got to do is carve it just yeah, this there's way. no YouTube video. That's what I'm saying. That, that, uh, they were brilliant people. Um, way, way beyond what but I... See, that, but that's what our... That's, so this discussion and ostensibly the reason we're broadcasting it is to, to start engaging people to start thinking the way that our ancestors did. Our ancestors were problem solvers. Yeah. They were critical problem thinkers solvers first. and problem solvers, yeah. and and they would have they would necessarily have to come up with a unique solution to their problem mm -hmm. because that's what was available and that's what made them so resilient, yeah. and allowed them to survive you know catastrophes we can only imagine yeah they survived yeah and and even in a lot of cases thrived and and here we are today mm -hmm. but they were problem solvers and critical thinkers and. And a lot of the every, and I'm not busting chops on Americans, but let's face it, that's who we're talking to. Yeah. Well, um, we've lost a lot of that. Edge. Well, yeah. So I think, well, again, so the reason that we're here is because of our ancestors and, and the the things that they were able to overcome. That's right. And the, their willingness to overcome them. I think artificially, a lot of people are in a, in a lot of people would not be able to overcome those because they just wouldn't be willing to do they just lay down and give up they don't have the agency yeah that's to, the word to, yeah. to, to handle their own affairs mm -hmm. um it's, it's agency that we're trying to develop in folks it's the it's the belief that i am in control of my own thoughts or actions mm -hmm. um in a survival situation if if your plan is to wait to be rescued, you're in big trouble. Yeah, that needs to be part of the plan. Yeah, but you're gonna have to rescue yourself mm -hmm. every time. You know, you might get lucky, and there might be some random hiker or some random <laughs> helicopter flies over and sees your mess. But that's plan B, not plan A. That's like that's like <laughs> plan, plan <C>. F. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's way yeah. down the line. I, yeah, you know, you got to have the agency to get things done. Mm -hmm. um, you and I have talked about this. You know. I, on paper, I'm not particularly gifted, but I ended up doing all this cool stuff in the military, not because I'm gifted, but because I, I had the will and I chose to go do these you things. You said yes. I said yes. Mm -hmm. and, and then I up and did it. Uh, <clears throat> but it was difficult. It wasn't easy. It didn't come natural. Mm -hmm. I had to learn it and, and all these things. And I think that's something, you, you know, you and I, kind of, we kind of share that understanding that the only reason most of these folks can't do it is because they won't get off the couch. Mm -hmm. They just won't. Interesting. So they get comfortable, right? It's that evil. Yeah. I, I think it's evil. Um, it leads to laziness and complacency and this it's never going to bother me. And those are the people that are usually the most shocked mm -hmm. when it does, in fact, come, come into their life. Yeah. So. Well, I, I've, I've heard people, I've, had, I've heard friends say, um, you know, that bushcraft is a hobby. It's not something that's... It's not necessary. It's a hobby. And, you know, I'm not busting any base chops if that's the way you think. I just, I just disagree because I think that it, it allows you to flex your brain and solve problems in a more primitive way. For sure. Yeah, and I, that's what I appreciate about it. You have what you have. You don't have what you want. Yeah. Right? And, and on the medical side, I dealt with this a lot. Listen, I've only got what's in this bag. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, he needs a surgeon. He needs a tool. And he, but I don't have that. Not gonna get it. So I'm going to have to make or get by with whatever we have. And I think it's kind of the same mental, it's the same mindset that goes into survival. So, yeah, I want a backpack full of, yeah. you know, lickies and chewies. But I don't have that. <laughs> lickies and chews. So <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to go make yeah. everything. Yeah. And, and I just, I just, creativity. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just love the, the problem solving that, that comes along with survival training. I think that that's my favorite part of it. It's not, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not the, the, the coolness factor of rubbing the two sticks together and getting flame. It's just the, it's just the, uh, the human ability to solve problems. That's what I love. So, so some things I, I did, I started doing differently when I was in the, the Q course for, for special forces was I kind of just sat back and did things, whatever, like everyone else. But in the Q course, I made a very conscious effort. If I had the chance, I was always the first one to practice. 
This way, I didn't know what the scenario was. Yeah. Because I was the first, and that forced me to generate the most amount of critical thinking possible. Mm -hmm. If I just stayed in the back and let watch three everybody or four else do it, the, right, and then I come in at ease. Well, great. I I may learn yeah. mechanically the steps of the task, but I'm not developing that critical thinking yeah. part of my brain alongside it. Yeah, I'm the same. Uh, I think that's that's awesome because I'm exactly the same way. So I, if I if I come across a problem, I try my best. Time constraints sometimes, but I try my best to not immediately Google it. Or right. I don't. I don't watch YouTube. Uh, honestly, I don't watch YouTube like almost never, because I feel like if I'm watching somebody's YouTube video, I should be out making a YouTube video. So, I, I don't watch the how tos very much. Um, so generally speaking, if I solve a problem in some way, it's because I f I figured it out with my own brain power, and I feel like that that's a much bigger win. You know, even if I did it wrong and inefficiently, you know, and somebody watches it and they say, oh, like, I, you know, whoever so-and-so does it this way and it's better. Like, yeah, probably. But this is how I solve that problem. Yeah so, yeah, so even if you're not mechanically inclined, you owe it to yourself to try to figure out and repair whatever's wrong with your the vehicle. The dishwasher, the right? car, yeah, yeah. the home. Yeah. Before you take it to... to some yeah. type of service that you owe it to yourself yeah. to try to figure that out. You're, you're denying yourself a chance to learn a new skill and continue to develop that critical thinking mm. part. You know, everybody thinks related to this subject. Everybody thinks Green Berets, Navy SEALs, they know, they know all this crazy stuff. They know everything. Well, yeah. they, they over time, they start to accumulate knowledge for sure. But really what you have in, in, a, special op, in a special operator is somebody who's comfortable in chaos. They don't have to have the answer. They'll make the answer. But they're, they're critical thinkers and problem solvers. Mm -hmm. We send these guys into these dangerously dangerous and ambiguous situations with little to no guidance, and we basically tell them, hey, figure it out. Figure it out. Yeah. And, and because they continue to do that over and over and over, and um, they start to get really good at it. Mm -hmm. They're very good at, at, at problem solving with limited resources, limited time, high pressure. And, and you don't have to join the military to, to, to learn that and develop that. No. You have, just don't walk away from the chance to do that. And it's usually small everyday chances like repairing your appliances. Whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anything, anything that goes wrong, don't immediately rush out to get help. But that's that, that's that mindset you have to have, I think, when it comes to field craft in general, is I, I, I would like to have what I want, but I, but I have what I have. Yeah. So I need to be able to walk into any situa situation and, and, and address problems as they come up. Yeah. So you get so much confidence with that. Yeah. And, and as you figured out, you start to build a mental inventory of all these skills that maybe are unique to you that you figured out. Yeah. Um, but you start to accumulate all this knowledge over time. And it's all knowledge that you've accumulated over time using your gray matter and you figure it out so it's gonna stick. Mm -hmm. So you automatically know the fundamentals and the principles behind the task because you had to do it. Yeah. As opposed to just learning the steps to start a friction yeah. fire. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I struggle sometimes with um, two things, I guess. I, I, I struggle with, uh, I, I don't ask for help on stuff when oftentimes I should. Whether that's pride getting in the way or something, I, I don't I don't know exactly how to define that, but but I'll I'll struggle through things and I'll and I'll endure the hardship that comes along with my hard headedness and when I could just ask for help. But the other side of that thing is uh, anything that I've learned the hard way by being stupid. I feel like I I own it like it's mine like yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? like yeah. I earned that thing that sticks that sticks yeah. in a way. When you learn things the hard way or, or you've had to endure discomfort mm. to, to acquire it, it sticks in a way that just learning it from a book in an academic yeah, setting. Or someone showing you. Right. Yeah. It, do, it doesn't quite, like there, a lot more repetition goes into somebody else in that normal teaching yeah. student environment. But when you go out there and you engage those critical thinking skills and you solve that problem, mm -hmm. yeah, it'll stick. Yeah. And it, well, then I always go back to friction fire. Like I, for example... Nobody taught me how to do a friction fire. No one said, you know, when, no one sat me down and said, hey, carve it this way, do it like this. This isn't working because of this. Like, no one did that for me. Not because people were jerks or anything. It was just because I was stupid and didn't want to ask for help. Mm -hmm. I was too stubborn to ask for help, and I, I wanted to do it on my own, you know? Sure. But because of that, like that, and now that I've been successful so many times, 
that's that's mine. That's like, right. That is my skill. I I own that. That is mine because I worked hard for it. Well, that's a big part of field craft in general. Is I'm not is, suggesting that people do that. By the way, it's <laughs> so much easier to just ask for help in some situations. <laughs> it is. Yeah. I, I mean, it, yeah. it, it is like. I, I like to take other people's classes because yeah. they may have, and, and I use shooting classes as an example. I like to go to other people's shooting classes because they may have solved a problem that I've faced and I yeah. never figured out. I'm still learning the same stuff. I may even already know it, but I'm going to get their particular brand, their particular flavor, yeah. and, and a little bit of their experience you know, transfers over to me sure. when I take their classes. But I learn the most by going out there and uh well doing it myself just doing it to, to the extent that you know you can do things by yeah yourself for sure i guess there needs just like anything else there needs to be a balance right well what is that's what i'm saying self-reliance is a virtue mm -hmm. you owe it to yourself to try to figure it out to yourself before you start asking for help and before you start pawning it off to a to a paid third party sure you owe it to yourself to to really get in there and see if you can if Figure it out. Yeah. Right. If you got that engine light on and you don't know anything about cars, okay, sit down, open try to up the book, out. try to figure it out, and then and then ask for help. Yeah. Uh, you may you may get lucky and you may you may discover something. Yeah. But every time, uh, and again, self reliance is a virtue. If, if my immediate default, anytime I'm faced with a anytime I'm faced with a dilemma is to outsource the Call solution, guy. right? Yeah. I'm not being self reliant. Mm -hmm. I'm being independent. Right, I'm I'm getting it done. I I'm in charge of whatever the project is, but I'm not doing that self reliance. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes sense. Okay, pretty much sums it up. Yeah, cool. All right, guys. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave lots of comments. Ask questions. Disagree with us. Tell us what you think. Is our primitive skills, bushcraft skills, practical for our lives today? Let me know. See ya.